Hello, world. Welcome back to Golf Subpar with Colt Nost and Drew Stoltz. The 151st Open Championship is in the books. And Brian Harmon, former guest of Subpar, is the champion golfer of the year, picking up his first major championship. Not only that, we're going to be seeing him over in Rome sleeves, rocking some beautiful polo Ralph Lauren gear at the Ryder Cup. I'm glad you brought that up. Brian is about to look beautiful in some RLX gear because the RLX golf collection draws inspiration from the traditional aesthetic of polo, updating it to create a modern sensibility focused on performance-driven design. From sophisticated styles to the most technologically advanced fabrics available, RLX golf is the ultimate in functional luxury and provides pieces that are ready for whatever the conditions bring on the course or off. Ralph Lauren is the official outfitter of the United States Ryder Cup team and partner of the AJGA. Ralph Lauren is proud to continue its sponsorship of golf ambassadors Andrea Lee, Billy Orschel, Davis Love III, Devin Bling, Doc Redman, Jonathan Bird, Nick Watney, Sean Foley, Smiley Kaufman, Todd Anderson, Tom Watson, Trevor Warblow, Troy Taylor III, Tyler Strafacci, and Captain Zach Johnson. The RLX Golf Collection is available in select Ralph Lauren stores, exclusive private clubs, resorts, and online at ralphlauren.com. Go treat yourself. Get yourself looking right. Get out there. It's the time of the year. Look good, play good, like we always say. Hey, Easy. play bad. At least you look good. Shit, you got something. Could be worse. Go pick you up. Go pick you up some polo now. All right, let's get into the Open Championship because Brian Harmon, let's be honest, uh, he put this thing to bed before before I woke up on Friday, so I know it was damn sure before you woke up on Friday morning with that 65 Absolutely ran away from the field. Never, honestly, looked in doubt. I think the closest anyone got all weekend was three shots, and that's with him getting off to a slow start Saturday and Sunday. Saturday, two over through four. Sunday, two over through five. But then here we go. Brian Harmon absolutely put on a stripe show and had that massive putter just absolutely working beautifully all week. That little moneymaker of his has been around for ages. Get an insurance policy on that thing. He was spectacular on the greens. I, I feel like the media narrative on this thing, there's some articles written, Colt, like, oh, golf, there's one in particular, like, golf was due for a dud or something like that. And I just have such a, like, I, I can't understand that narrative because it's like, all right, if if this performance had come from John Rahm, uh, Rory McIlroy, Scotty Shepard, name it, one of the top five players in the world, they'd be like, oh, my God, look what we just got to witness. One of the best players in the world, boat racing the field. This is elite special golf that you don't get to see all that often. But it comes from Brian Harmon. All of a sudden, it's like, oh, there was no drama. This thing was a dud. It seems like such a double standard. Like when when Rom kind of ran away and hide at, at the Masters this year, nobody was saying, oh, this sucks. It was like, wow, he came out of this shitty wave and he still won by, what, four shots at that thing. It's, but this when Brian Harmon does it, it's like, oh, it's a dud. I don't really understand that. This dude's been a monster since he's been in junior golf cult. You and I know we played against him. He's really never had a hiccup in his career. And this was a special, special week. Well-deserved for Brian Harmon. He's been doing it for a long time. I've seen him run away from some fields. He won the 2007 Porter Cup, a very prestigious amateur event up in Niagara Falls by nine. Played on the 05 Walker Cup team. Missed the 07 Walker Cup team, which, by the way, in my opinion, he should have been on with us over there in Northern Ireland. And then came back and played on the winning team in Marion and has four wins in the Walker Cup. He's going to be a great addition to that Ryder Cup team. But you're like you're like what you said, he's not that flashy, right? He's 5'7". He's 114th in distance off driving distance on the PGA Tour, 109 mile an hour club head speed. Um, you know, not the biggest personality in the world, even though when he was on subpar, I thought he was fantastic. He's super intelligent, fun to be around. Um, he likes to feral some hogs, which mm -hmm, much mm -hmm. like you. Ride a tractor, that. yeah, similar, yep. similar. But man, you just, I, I hate that they're that people are actually hating on this major championship because I think we need to tip our cap and pay respect to this guy for putting on a dominating performance. I mean, like you said, if anyone else would have done that, they'd have been raving about how great he played. And here this guy is, goes out and just, I mean, he cruised to victory. It was something special to watch. Never in doubt, like after Friday, you get that kind of a lead. It's like, okay, the only thing that can happen is I mess up. And it's all downside at that point because people are, whether it's, you know, going to happen or not, people are kind of anointing you at that point. And he really never let it even get close. John Rahm got within three on Sunday. At that point, I was like, this could get interesting. John makes another one or two or, or Harmon slips up again. But what does he do after his bogeys? Boom, he seemed to bounce back with at least one, sometimes two in a row to give himself that cushion again. And he just put it to bed. That's really, really hard to do, especially for a guy that's never won a major championship before. Only two uh, wins on the PGA Tour in his career up until that point. And also I want to get to this Colt. I felt like 
you know, you talk to guys, even Americans, they're like, dude, when you go over to open the championship, the gallery is there, like, they get it. They're a little more educated, I guess, on the game of golf. You could have a hard chip, chip it to eight feet, and you might get a huge round of applause because they understand how difficult that was. I feel like this week, dude, they were in Harmon's ass, like, from the start, right? There's a lot more heck. I heard cheers when he would hit a bad shot. I heard boos when he would make things. And it wasn't all of them, but it was enough of them to come through on television. And I tell you what, I don't even mind that because, of course, they want their home guys to win the golf tournament. Tommy Fleetwood had a ton of support. Of course, Rory had a ton. So they're going to root for their guys. I got it. I think that I think that's cool in golf but it made me very excited for what potentially could be coming in rome in a few months because i think these fans are fired up i think we're going to get a rowdy fan base over there a bunch of people on property and i'm super pumped for that Ryder cup for which brian Harmon will be a part of yeah he will and you know i'm not here for the heckling in golf that's just not the sport it is now at the Ryder cup it's a totally different deal but the guy on saturday that fired brian Harmon up probably wishes he didn't speak to him saying he does he doesn't have the stones for this um, you know, that stuck with Brian. He talked about it in his press conference afterwards, but uh, he damn sure does. And everyone that knows Brian Harmon knows, knew he yeah. had the stones for this. I mean, the guy doesn't blink. Um, Kevin Kisner told me, you know, the, the higher the heart rate gets, the better Brian Harmon performs. And he's known that since he was a freshman in college. Uh, I've played so many rounds of golf with him. He is not scared of the moment. Uh, I, I thought it was a little inappropriate. You know, when they announced him on the first tee on Sunday, there were some boos. I'm yeah, like, boos. What are we doing here? Yeah, and I mean, I know Tommy Fleetwood is – is from Southport, which is 30 miles away. You had you had Matt Jordan, who's a club champion there at, at Hoy Lake. I mean, obviously had a ton of support, by the way. Shout out to him for finishing tied for 10th. That was an awesome moment, birdie in the last. But I, I thought some of the heckling on Harmon wasn't really necessary. But honestly, it might have helped him. Yeah, I think, of course, it helps him. I think he's the one guy, like, that's not going to phase him. That just fires him up more, whereas some guys, that might get to him. I mean, you can go back to Bryson DeChambeau and the let's go Brooksy and stuff like that, right? Like, that rattled him. He hated it. He was having people tossed out. Harmon's not like that. But my, like, point in this is normally the Open Championship, like, they're very respectful. Mm -hmm. uh, they appreciate the game of golf. Of course, they want one of their people to win, but they will applaud good golf on the other side. And a lot of them still did, but there was a lot that weren't. And it had kind of a little mini Ryder Cup feel. And when you get to the Ryder Cup, it's like all bets are off. Then you then there's booze all That's the time. Different. You know, then there's heckling. There's And it's, I was like, well, if this is showing up at the Open Championship, I can't wait to see what Rome looks like. But I think a lot of guys thrive on that and especially Brian Harmon, but he handled that thing. Well, that putter was a joke uh, the entire week. And it's cool to see a guy win Colt. That's not just hit it as hard as you can and go get it. There's different ways to get it done. There's just not a ton of golf tournaments on the PGA tour over here in the States where that doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't play an, an enormous role and you give him a golf course where it doesn't. And he's, he can show up and he can do what he just did win by six against the best field in golf, more or less. It's a very simple. I mean, he he's a stud. I mean, he, he was ranked 26th in the world going into the week, now up to 10th. Um, whether you believe in the official World Golf Rankings or not, Brian Harmon is one of the best players in the world. And congratulations on your first major champion, major championship. And it wasn't the only win for subpar and not the only left-hander to win on the PGA Tour. Shout out Akshay Batia, 21 years old, picking up his first win out in Tahoe at the Barracuda in a playoff over Patrick Rogers. Clutch birdie putt on 18 to force that playoff. But so happy for Akshay, man. This is going to do great. Do Really big things for him and his future. Yeah, winning on special temporary membership, going to be in the FedEx Cup playoffs now. All that weight that he's picked up, Colt, you know what I mean? Starting to play, pay dividends, but uh, good to see him get that thing done. Um, enormous boost in his career, not only getting in the FedEx Cup playoffs, all the designated events, well, we all gotta the invitations, check on that. all that. We, there's some conflicting reports whether or not he gets in the playoffs or not because of him not being a full member with the Barracuda, Barracuda being an opposite event. There's some different reports saying he doesn't get points, so he's actually up to 90th in the FedEx Cup, which not, would not get him in the playoffs. So I we should say be potentially, yeah, I've heard the same thing, potentially get him in the playoffs. He's got time going forward to play his way into that top 70, but uh huge week for him. Bad news for him, still can't rent a car. Good news is you get whatever the nicest U-Haul is on property every single week. Well, speaking of playoffs, the playoffs are quickly approaching and there is no better place to get in on the golf action than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $100 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. Go to FanDuel.com slash subpar to join today. We are on to the 3M Championship. Not the strongest field in the world. Justin Thomas will be teeing it up, trying to get in those playoffs, but we got head-to-head -head matchups. You got outright winners, top 10s, top 20s, low whatever you want. We got it over at FanDuel. And when you win, you get paid instantly. So go make sure you download the FanDuel app, use code subpar and sign up today. 
All right, buddy, let's see if we can get hot this week. Coming off a major championship, everybody's always a little tired, a little jet lagged, but my man, Sung JM, he ain't ever tired. He plays every single week. He's going off at 16 to 1. Give me him as my favorite this week. I like that. I am also going with the guy that's coming from across the pond. Love the form he's in right now. He's going off at 14 to 1. Nice form recently. Uh, T68 in his last two starts. I think he has cemented his spot on the Ryder Cup team. I'm not positive, but he damn, he's damn close to it if he hasn't. He is due for a win on the PGA Tour. Give me Cam Young, 14 to 1. Little surprised he's teeing it up this week. Um, has had a big stretch, but hey, you got that charter going from the from the Open Championship over to Minnesota. Nice little ride home. Um, relaxing week out there at the 3M. So yeah, no doubt he's one of the favorites. I'm going to be keeping my eye on Justin Thomas. So this is a big couple big. of weeks because right now he's outside the top 70. He's outside, you know, even the I know it's top six is automatic on the Ryder Cup, but he's outside the top 12. Big couple of weeks, I and mean, we could possibly see. Justin Thomas teeing it up at the Wyndham Championship where he made his PGA Tour debut as a 16-year-old, which it would be would be shocking. Just hasn't been the season, but watch out for him this week. Uh, as far as my dark horse, friend of the program, finished T6 last week, an incredible birdie on the last hole from Fairway Bunker, one of the best shots of the week. Give me the Bo Show. Bo Hostler going off at 50-1. to 1. I love that. I feel like Bo's knocking on the door. He's hanging around. He's been working hard on that golf swing. Looks a lot different than when you saw him first come on the PGA Tour, or even before that when he was what is he, 16, playing up there at Olympic in the U.S. Open. He's going good. I like that pick with Bo. Colt, my dark horse, I'm very excited about this one. I think this is potentially a great story in golf. I'm going off with the guy. He's 42 to 1. He's having a revival in his career of late. He's got three consecutive top tens with a couple chances to win in there during that time. Switched from a short putter to a long putter, so it's changed everything for him. He's always hit the ball great, but now the putter is starting to cooperate a little bit. Give me Lucas Glover, 42-1. to 1. No glove, no love. I like it. Mm -hmm. This golf course uh, gives you plenty of room off the tee. It's a birdie fest. Um, it looks like the weather. It's going to be rather hot, so it should be playing short. Expect a lot of birdies. If he can keep that long putter working, I don't mind it because no, there are very few guys that hit the golf ball better than Lucas Glover. Yeah, it's just it's he just looks different with it. These 10, 12 footers, especially the short ones too. It's like they're going in the way you expect them to go and not just hitting them and hoping that they're going in. So he's been playing good, man. Three consecutive top tens and on golf courses where they've been making tons of birdies like this week. All right. Well, let's make some money this week and don't miss your chance to tee off with one hundred dollars in bonus bets, win or lose, when you make your first five dollar bet. Go to fanduel.com slash subpar to sign up today. Make every moment more with FanDuel. FanDuel, official betting operator of the PGA Tour. Must be 21 years and older and present in select states. First online real money wager only. $10 deposit required. Refund issued as non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire in 14 days. Restrictions apply. See full terms at FanDuel.com sportsbook. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Hope is here. Gambling helpline ma.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts. Call 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY. That's 467-369 in New York. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino, LLC. Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit FanDuel.com slash RG in Colorado, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Tennessee, or Virginia. 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text Next Step to 53342 in Arizona. 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut. 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana, 1-800-522-4700, or visit ksgamblinghelp.com in Kansas, 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana, or www.mdgamblinghelp.org in Maryland, 1-800-F-522-4700 in Wyoming, or visit 1-800-GAMBLER.NET in West Virginia. All right, let's get to our interview this week. We got a fun one. This guy, he's kind of come out of his shell in the last few years. It's turned into... A really funny guy on social media has picked up a ton of distance. But as Jordan Spieth told us back in the day, if he had a 10-footer for his life, he's picking this man right here to, to putt it for him. We got Greg Chalmers on this week's Subpar. All right, folks, we have got a beauty with us here today. He's got 11 professional wins around the globe, world class with the flat stick, hell of a follow on Twitter, and he has been absolutely hosed. Out of some PIP money the last couple of years. We're going to change that today, hopefully, <laughs> from Perth, Australia. A great bloke, Greg the Snake Chalmers. How are we doing, Greggy? Drew, doing good, man. Colt, how you guys doing? 
Ozzy, 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 things are good. By the oh, way, man, better you, now. You 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 mentioned some of those accomplishments. How about four hundred and seventy nine yeah. PGA Tour events? Yeah, How's that feel? It, old. I, I tell you, um, I think I, I I don't think I'll make it to five hundred, and I think you get a cake if you do. I don't think you get much more than that. So. Uh, I don't think I'll get 21 more out of me. I'm hoping I'm playing with old people as well. So that'd be the plan. Well, Sleaze will donate you his one. That'll get you at 480. And then I'll give you 20 of mine. Greg, <laughs> that helps you, dog. I didn't do you, much with it. Are you just at one? I'm just at one. I'm just a one and done guy. You know what I mean? <laughs> I was like, I'm going to give like the it. people a taste, especially the Mexican fans. I'm going to give them a little taste of El Gringo. El Guingro Guapo is what they called me down there. And I just shot a couple <laughs> mid-70s and said, see you later, folks. That's I'm all out. she wrote. I'm out. Yeah. yeah. Just a little taste. But, Greg, I mean, here in October, you're going to be turning 50. And I know you have totally changed your game over the last couple of years. You picked up a ton of speed. How excited are you to be 50 and get out there on the PGA Tour Champions? You know, I um, I, I want to chase it. I, about uh, about five years ago, I got diagnosed with uh, arthritis in my spine in like five joints. And, and so I took a couple of years off and then when on the back end of that, I'm on some good drugs that help me now. And so I can actually play golf. I thought I, I've got to do something to not get even slower. And so I started, I met a trainer. I trained at a play in a facility just near me in Dallas called uh, premier movement training. And, and they, they, they deal in speed production. And I went in there at about 109 and on club head speed and about 160 ish on ball speed. Um, I hit 120 I haven't hit it again. I average about 116, 115, and over 170 round ball speed. So I'm I'm keen, man. I'm really keen. I just got to you know go to Q school, and and uh, I've got a sort of a second wind about me at the moment, which I think is pretty common for this age bracket. You know, you kind of really look forward to the opportunities that, and it's a wonderful option you have. You know, to be able to keep playing. I mean, yeah, and you and I were talking about old. it. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Just go to, ahead. Cool. No, just to pick pick up that much speed at 49 years old. That's impressive, and that takes a lot of work. Cam Piercy did tell me, though, ever since you've done this, the rest of your game's gone to shit. <laughs> I, did, I didn't have much game anyway. My putting's still all right. My iron play still sucks balls. Um, and the, it's, that's part of the reason why I tried it. I'm like, well, it's not like I drive it straight anyway. So I may as well be crooked and then a little further in the rough. So um, I'm I, look. I'm I'm just I'm just excited about the chances. So you know, part of it is just getting on there first. You know, it's a very difficult tour to get onto and get after. So um, we'll see how we go. I, I'm I'm pre I'm really energized about it though. So looking forward. Bernhard is fucked when you get up there. <laughs> get them all in now, buddy. Greggy boy is coming. But you talk about Dude. your second wind. Like you got a second wind. You're real hyped on going to the Champions Tour and stuff. Like because you're in that kind of gray area right now like i call it 45 to 50 where it's like all right you're on past champions you get starts but we were just talking before we came on like you got in john deere recently and you don't even know you're getting in the event until a few days before like it's hard to take advantage of those starts when you don't know when they're coming sure you have some you know that you can bank on but half the time you don't even know when you're gonna go yeah it's it's look everything about it is harder everyone's younger than you everyone's likely better than you um, and, and a lot of your skills start to diminish. I noticed like some of the stuff that I used to be really good at, um, I have to work at now because I'm not doing it all the time. Like reading greens, um, that kind of slowed down on me. And I'm like, what's going on here? I just wasn't used to not doing it. I used to do it every week, all day, every day. And so when you get on this kind of old man schedule where you're only playing, you know, 10 to 12 times, um, you know, essentially your game, you're up against it. Basically everyone's younger, fitter and faster and you're not playing as much as them as well. So uh, you really are, you're fighting an uphill battle. You know, you go back 15, 20 years when you were playing, I mean, you were much younger, obviously, on the PGA Tour. Could you ever imagine, like, how much the game was going to change to where, I mean, now it, it's just, it's a power game. Like, guys like you, the way you played when you were in your 30s, mm. like, they don't exist anymore for the most part. No, 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 you're right. And And look, what, what's happened is power has gone from an asset to a necessity now. Like it, it used to be something that was just like, oh, that's an amazing asset you have. You hit it longer than everybody else. Now you have to train for it. And you have to have it. If someone comes out of college now and I play a practice round with them and they hit it next to me, I'm like, oh boy, <laughs> you, you, you might want to get on something, but step on this thing. Because you need to carry it, you know, you know, 300-ish is kind of nice these days. If you can carry it that as a young man, 295, 300. And so you need a little speed going to get that going. Yeah, if yeah, you if don't, you, you might want to better... update your LinkedIn page. 
Yeah, you better have a superpower somewhere tucked in there if you're not hitting it like that anymore. But you talk about how the game has changed, Greg. What about off the course? Like just the the attitude, like the demeanor of players um, at golf tournaments. When you come up, let's call it the early 2000s. What was it like then? Guys having fun, maybe going out at night, you know, playing cards, whatever, versus what you see now when you're out there. Um, I, I would say... Uh, you know, to be fair, to be fair, I probably was not like Colt was more of a card player kind of get after it guy. Um, I was pretty serious about it, and I would say the more more money you play for, the more the less socializing there is. Um, you know, I, I realized that when I was playing in Europe, everyone kind of pretty friendly, and we all catch buses together, and everyone meets downstairs and go to dinner. Um, you can go, you know, corn ferry tour. Everyone's pretty friendly and nice, and then you get on the PGA tour, and you can go the whole week and not see anybody. You know, if you really want to, you get in your car and go home. Um, so it's it's probably going more and more down that path. I think it's becoming a lot more like tennis. You know, everyone, if people are having groups of people travel with them. You know, like a, everyone talks about their team now. Um, we probably didn't have as much of that because you couldn't afford to do that. Uh, so now, you know, everyone, some of these guys, when you look at, at some of these young guys now, they're multi-million dollar companies, you know, potentially if not already. And so you can afford to look after your body and have a trainer or, you know, some people to help you out, your manager travels and your, your sports psych or whoever, you know, you can afford to do all these things so you can just concentrate on golf. And it's a, it's a real asset and it's really moving towards more of a tennis model where you're kind of in and out a lot quicker, I think. You know, Salih's mentioned you, you've won 11 times around the world. You've played everywhere. I mean, you're, you're, you're a journeyman. Can you remember your first trip to America and like what was – I mean, because it's a big decision to leave Australia to come over here and try to chase the dream of playing on the PGA Tour. Yeah, I, I went to Q School in, uh, in 1998. I, I was exempt into finals. Um, I actually looked not long ago. There's, there's only three of us still playing at a, at a decent level. Mike Weir won that week, um, and he's still running. Uh, Brian Gay got his card that week and myself. Um, and I think Jonathan Kay, actually, one of your boys down there in Scottsdale, mm. he might still be slapping around occasionally. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's you know, a few of the guys are actually – I think there's nearly more players in that group that got their cards that are caddying right now, uh, guys like Pete Jordan and things like that. But it's a, um, it, it is a different move. It's a big move, but it was always the dream for Aussies to end up in America. Um, and so it was always and, – and, and as Australians, we're just used to the idea there is no living to be made staying in Australia if you want to play golf. You have to get out of there. And so you have to get on Japan or Europe or, or here. And if you want to play golf for a living. So it's just kind of a given. You have to do it and embrace where you're going. Um, and America is pretty great. Um, it's an awesome place to play golf. And so, you know, you kind of jump on it and get pretty excited about it, to be honest. Yeah, let's go back even before that, Greg. Like your come up in Australia. It's changed now. And I know some of these guys go to Institute of Sport and things like that. But how did you get going in golf? Was there was there anything like that? Was there instructors or were you just kind of more self-taught and, and did it on your own? No, we had a, we had every state in Australia has like a program for the the high level golfers that you go to. Um, and so they and in every in every major tournament, amateur tournament in the country, um, all of those players and there might be three or four from each state are, are, are funded to go to the major tournaments around the country. So you start to learn how to travel and play the game and travel by yourself very early. Uh, you're probably at 16, 17, 18, where you're starting to fly around the country, staying in hotels that, and, and playing the game against your peers and at a high level. So um, they do a really good job. I think the biggest difference is you guys in America, you have talent just based on numbers. We don't have numbers. So we have to build talent and, and fund it and look after it and grow it and get the most out of people uh, because we just don't have the numbers playing the game that you guys do. That's that's crazy. Um, you know, obviously, for for us, when I first started on the PGA Tour, I, we actually had an off season, and a lot of the guys would go down to Australia and play in the Australian Open, the Australian PGA, the Aussie Masters, and stuff like that. But with the way the PGA Tour has gone to basically a wraparound schedule, how much has that hurt those events down in Australia? Because, I mean, we used to see Tiger pop up all the time down there. I know he was getting crazy appearance fees, but the fields used to be really good. Yeah, yeah, massively is the answer. And, and look... Um, Probably, you know, one of the byproducts that I'm hoping for in the, the new sort of setup of the PGA Tour is that they'll, they'll start to consider world golf, not just American golf. You know, the PGA Tour has kind of danced around the world and done, schedule-wise, certainly done whatever it wanted. And, and if you have an, an event over here for $8 million and an event in Australia for a $1 million, 
it's pretty easy math that of where you want to play. Um, and so, you know, in, in, the, in the early 90s, Australia had on its schedule, we had a tool with like 18 tournaments, right? And now we have three or two, you know? So it's, it's just, it's just, there's only so many weeks in the year. And, and so it's a very popular game and the golf courses are world-class. And so it, it has a place in the game as a country and uh, for people to go play. So it'd be great if it was factored into the decision. And I think other countries are probably thinking the same thing. You know, South Africa is probably thinking the same. And at that time of year in November, December, there is no better place to go play. There is nowhere else that's that good. So let me yeah, add something to the back end of that real quick. Just yeah. while he said, he mentioned the great golf courses and everything because I'm making my first trip to Australia in October to do the Asian Pacific amateur. I'm covering, I'm actually going to take my sticks. So we're going to be, it's at Royal Melbourne. By the way, we yep. saw how incredible the president's cup was there. I know that's one, but if you gave me a two or three other golf courses, I got to check out while I'm there, what would they be? You're in Melbourne only. Yeah. At the okay. crown casino. Yep. 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 Lovely place. Um, so you want to hit up uh, Kingston Heath, which is where the Australian – actually, the two courses where the Australian Open were last year, Kingston Heath and Victoria Golf Club. Um, talk to Jeff Ogilvy. He's a member of Victoria. He can get you on there. Mind you, you're probably pretty connected, I'd imagine, mate. Um, and uh, that would be the two I'd smash straight away. And then where, where would you rank Royal Melbourne among those three? I'd go Kingston 1, Royal 2. But that's just me personally. Really? Yeah, really me personally. I've heard – I've heard incredible things. All right, yeah. so Kingston's one for you down there. Where does that rank in terms of like globally? I mean, you've played almost all of them. I've you know, heard nothing honest, but rave reviews about these places. Yeah, and look, to be honest with you, mate, I haven't played as many because you know, I, you know, to be fair, I haven't played a lot of your your major venues up in the northeast. You know, and and in, you know, in the in the mid sort of Chicago area, I haven't played a lot of the stuff um, that you see that is awesome. You know, so. Uh, I haven't done a lot of time over playing up. In, is it uh, Rhode Island and everything? Not Rhode Island, um, Long Island. The Hamptons. Where you have all, up, yeah, yes, yeah, up yeah. there. That's yeah, so I haven't done it. Yeah, I haven't done a lot of those. Um, you know, my favorite ones over here are your sort of your, your Riviera is just it's great for us because it reminds us of Australia. It's all the same trees um, and it's all the same grasses and it's just awesome. Um, but you know, Royal Royals in. I haven't done Pine Valley and things like that, and I, I, it's on my bucket list of. You know, I just got to get off, you know, playing for a living and sort of be, have social golf be more of a priority. You just got to play shit here, dude. It's easy. Yeah, I'm, I'm, after <laughs> I last fixed week, that a long I'm, time. I'll, I'll tell you how to do it. You start on sucking the more ass week. and then you get to play wherever you want. It's a great deal. Let's stay yeah. on that Australian Open for a while, though, because you had a huge one in 2011. I think that was your second one that you'd won, but you held off, like Colt mentioned, Tiger Woods in that final round. He was charging. Uh, was the other one, uh, John, was it John Sinden? I believe, yeah, but no, what, yep. Tiger, let's just say you, you're one of the few guys that, you know, can say I beat Tiger Woods. There's not a ton of them when you would hold the trophy. What do you remember most about that week? Um, just, a, just a hot last day. Uh, wasn't really thinking consciously about, you know, what, what it was with Tiger or anything like that. Um, just got hot going the last day, three under through a, a handful, um, and then just hung on like crazy going to the, you know, to the coming in the – I hit it to – Hit it to two feet on 15, um, and that was for, on a par three, a birdie, and that got me kind of a couple in front. And then I missed the green on 16, missed the green, and, and had to get up and down, made a five-footer. And then I missed the green on 18, it's a tough par three, and I had a, one of those 40-yard bunker shots into the wind kind of thing and hit it out to six feet and made that. Um, and the, the funny story there was, uh, well, I thought it was funny. I, was, I got home, and I sit down, and I, and I was drinking it. I had a bourbon, and I'm just sitting having a drink watching it. And I'm watching the highlights and the commentator goes, the shot of the day. And I'm like, oh, well, it must be my seven iron to two feet. That won me the tournament. And he goes, it's Tiger Woods. And I'm like, are you mother <laughs> not happy? But like, the guy gets everything. But uh, it, it's a cool, cool experience. And you know, I can't talk enough or tell people enough to get down there and have a game. You're going to love it, Colt. You're going to love it. Yeah, I can't wait. But just staying on Tiger there, because, I mean, you played in – the peak tiger era, right? I mean, mm -hmm. at 2004 or sorry, year 2000 Valhalla, you were in one of the last few groups on Sunday when him and Bob may were battling it out, but tell the people at home, like how insane it was playing in the same tournaments as tiger woods. And did you ever, how many times did you get paired with him? So the, yeah, the, the handful. And the first time was actually when he was 17, we played the Eisenhower together at where they played the Ryder cup in France. Um, 
we played the Eisenhower together that week. Uh, I, and that's the first time I'd ever heard of him because we, you know, we didn't hear much about him in Australia. We, he was big over here as an amateur, but, you know, in those days, the world was a bit bigger. You didn't travel as easily as you did, you know, sort of in, this is in the late, the early 90s. Um, it wasn't as easy to get over to America. It was more expensive and blah, blah, blah. So I didn't really know much about Tiger. Um, roll in and play that Eisenhower with him. And I was 19 and he was 17, I think. And I'm like, holy shit, this guy's pretty fucking good. Um, <laughs> and uh, and uh-huh. then I got him again at Memorial. And this was, this was telling to me. We played Memorial. First two days together, I was first alternate. And so I took, um, I took uh, Craig Stadler's place. He pulled out. So it ended up with me, him, and uh, Billy Andrade. He shot seven, He won that year. I think it was the year he won like a shit ton, like nine, ten times or something, 2000, uh, 2001 or something. Anyway, he shoots 65. He hits three sh- full shots inside six feet and a couple of them inside a foot and a half. And I read the quote in the paper the next day and he said, oh, I didn't have my best stuff but I'm really pleased with the position I'm in. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Like this was not his <laughs> best stuff. And I saw some shots that day that I have never seen since. And I've played with a ton of great players and I'm like, we're in trouble. Like this, this guy's just too good. And I, I really wish for today's players, you could see, like they say they wanted to see it, but I really wish you could see it. It was phenomenal. Yeah. Well, he was the best they- in virtually Every yeah. aspect. And then you take that time when you played with him at Memorial. You fast forward, then you beat him at the Australian Open. Like, I know you've won on the PGA Tour before, but is that your proudest accomplishment at the pro, given that, like, dude, that was Tiger during Tiger time? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I don't know. I mean, I, th- th- when you win and you don't, like, let's be fair, I haven't, I haven't won, like, prodigiously. So I, ha- I have only 11 experiences. They're, they're kind of like your kids, aren't they? You don't really want to pick your favorite. Um, I would say the Barracuda was probably the biggest moment in a lot of ways for me because my career was winding down and going in the wrong direction. And so that really turned me around and it came at the right time. Um, but certainly, you know, to, to your goal is always to beat the best players you can. And so, you know, that win in Australia was a, was a big moment. But I, I'd probably look at Barracuda, to be honest, as there's something that I hang my hat on the most. Yeah, you beat some quality players there. Gary Woodland finished second, and then yours truly finished third. <laughs> so you held off. Oh, is that you held right? Off some massive, incredible, the, ta- yeah, incredibly the, talented players. All the big names, <laughs> mate. All the big names. No wonder that one's more important. Yeah, we didn't even mention that. That's my favorite win in the history of the PGA Tour, by the way, Greg. Just because you took it from Gary. <laughs> you see, good. See, you, mate. Of yours. If you watch, I went back watch the highlights, and I watched him play the back nine. And uh, I'm like, he should have won that tournament. Then he bogey, he bogeyed yeah. 18, and you eagled it, so it looked like you won by a decent spread. But yeah. it was like tied going into the yeah. last or something. Yeah, like I that. was, I was leaking gas, and uh, I was really struggling. I didn't, I wasn't hitting the ball particularly well, and uh, and and I just kind of limped it home. And then I needed a par on the last to end up making an eagle, but only because he had seven on his hand, he dumped it in the bunker and hit it out and three putted. I think, but yeah, he he probably should have won. That's well, that we're killer glad DNA. Didn't. Some people have it, some people don't. You know what let's, I mean? Let's let's move on because I, I mean your putting is something that we just talk about all the time. I mean, you're known as one of the greatest putters in the game, and a popular question that always gets asked, and it's best to ask someone who's actually really good at it: Are great putters born, or do they develop into great putters? Yeah, it's a good 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 question. Yeah, um, I would say it's definitely an area you can develop, but you have to start really early. Um, I was I was blessed that I, I was a member of a golf club. Uh, it's called Shelley Beach Golf Club. It's a beautiful. It's right on the ocean, um, just north of Sydney, about a couple of hours, and it only had a putting green. And so when I started playing the game, we had we had a net to hit balls into, and we don't have a lot of great practice facilities. And you'll see that when you go down there, the ones you're going to do, but quite a lot of courses they just don't. And so I we just had putting competitions. So I spent endless and endless hours of just competing and putting. And I think the other thing that really helps is uh, I, I did have a pretty natural tempo that was nice and things like that. The other thing that helps is everyone keeps telling you from a very young age that you, you're a left-hander, you're going to be good at putting. And so you build this awesome belief pattern, you know. So um, I think part of it is work. You know, I outworked a lot of people, uh, but some of it might be just you just got lucky that you're at a golf course that had good greens and a great putting green, and that's all you did. 
Are you still using the Bobby Grace? Yeah, I'm a 20 odd 20 odd years on that one. Um that was gonna be my question is what's older, the Bobby Grace putter or Tom Kim? Ooh. <laughs> it's right in there. <laughs> yeah, so Bobby's uh Bobby's what's he, nineteen? He's twenty. He just, he just turned twenty one. Just turned twenty one. Yeah, yeah so that's yeah. that'd be a great stat, wouldn't it, if I ever got to play with him? Dude, my putter's older than you. Uh, that'd be that's awesome. Great. Yeah, yeah, it's it's been good to me. Um, and look, it, it's it's a it's a skill I, I've had, and I've made. I've, I, to be honest, I've survived on it because, I mean, putting matters, but nowhere near as to me as much as hitting. I mean, I won the strokes gain one year, and I finished one hundred twenty third on the FedEx Cup. So you still got to hit. You know, it's no good when you're putting for par all the time. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I've always argued that there's something like innate with the great putters and whether it's just people telling them over and over that they're going to be great putters or they are great putters. But like take you, for instance, you've been a great putter your whole career and you spent tons of time on it growing up. And sure, that plays a role. But take take one of your countrymen, Adam Scott, like he just he flushes it right and has since he came out. He's one of the world's greatest ball strikers, but he doesn't hasn't putted historically that great. But I can guarantee you, Adam Scott's probably spent a bazillion hours on the putting green working on his putting and yet just some way or in the same way you've probably spent a million hours on your golf swing. It's like, he's just going to be a better ball striker and you're just going to be a better putter. Like it is what it is. Yeah. And I, and I think you, there is something to that. There's absolutely something to that because um, I, I think sometimes too, with belief patterns, you know, and not to get too much into the psychology or all that stuff of it, but it, you wonder sometimes that you play up and down to your beliefs, you know? So if you don't believe you're very good at something, you'll, you'll end up being shit at it. Right. And, and vice versa. A hundred percent. And, you know, I mean, guys out there on the PJ Tour, you spend so much time together. We know who the best, you know, bunker players are, the best chippers, the best putters. H have many guys come to you and tried to pick your brain about putting? You know, occasionally, um, I I've actually entered into some coaching, online coaching a little bit. and But the pros, it's really funny. Um, we don't talk a lot about stuff like that. I, I don't know if it's you know, we don't, we don't want to bother someone else or, and I'm at an age now that's kind of like, I'm happy to give back. I'm like, Hey, fire away, dude. You're probably going to beat me anyway. Like I don't give a fuck. Um, <laughs> so, so it doesn't bother me at all. Uh, I think sometimes some guys might want to ask, but don't, but um, I, I, I might, I haven't sort of been inundated with, Oh, you know, I'd love to talk to you about putting. I think some of it might be like a pride thing. It's like, dude, we have the same I, job. Possibly. I'm supposed to beat you. You're supposed to beat me. Like, I'm not going to go. You have to kind of swallow your pride to go with that, ask for advice to somebody. Like, dude, do you mind? Can I ask you about yeah. this? It's like you're yeah. conceding like you're better than me at this thing, even though it's yes. blatantly obvious, I'm sure. I, I totally agree because I, I didn't do it when I was young either. And there were I was playing against and with better players all the time. And, and, and I never went to them. And it's only now I look back. And if I have regrets, that's one of them for sure. Well, I didn't didn't pick their brain. I just talked to them and, you know, gather some knowledge that might actually help me. I got to ask you about, obviously, one of the most famous Australian golfers, and that's Greg Norman. I mean, he was the man back in the day, and obviously a lot going on with him with live golf and everything. What's the perception of Greg Norman nowadays in Australia? Yeah, it's a good question. I think... Um, you know, he carried the game in our country for a number of years. Uh, there was a time there where if... If Greg was in the field, you had a, you you had an event. That's all you needed. Uh, they would flow through the gates. He was the, you know, as Tiger is here, he was that in Australia. Um, Australians aren't caring so much about the politics of live golf. To be honest, you saw what happened in Adelaide. Um, they they went and watched golf. They had a good time. Uh, they don't care about all the other stuff. And because we are starved for good players, we are starved for high level competition and players that want to come down and travel and play golf in Australia. So, and normally, and this was the perfect scenario, Liv were paying the bill instead of our local uh, governing bodies. And so we didn't have to pay people a million dollars to get down there. Um, yeah. So, but back to, you know, Greg is, um, I, 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 I'm guessing, I feel like he's still well thought of and everyone's proud of like the stuff that he's done in the game has been amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, and now he's, you know, he's been, in the business world, he's one of the few golfers that's actually parlayed all his success into really successful businesses as well. If you look at what he's done with different things, with whether it's wine or grass or, or whatever he's into. So in, a lot of other players have tried that and failed. Um, so 
I th- I think, and you'll you can ask that question when you get down there, mate. When I was down there late last year, I everyone was like, "Yeah, I'm all in. They're good on him." Mm-hmm. So interesting. Is it the same with the players too, Greg? Like some of the players here in the states, and it kind of depended on what you said on your way out the door. I feel like, but some of the players were villainized here in the states when they left. Is it that way? Like, do people have any, you know, ill will towards Cam Smith or anything like that for making? Oh no, time? no. Yeah, I didn't think so. No zero. Yeah, zero. Um, not. N- not well, not to my knowledge, the guys I talk to. And here's the thing with that: um, these guys haven't changed as human beings. They're, like they're, they're my half of them are my friends when they went, and they're still my friends now. So um, you know, you got offered a bag of money, you go take your bag of money. Um, all good. Um, but yeah, it's look, it's going to be interesting to see how that to how that all changes and evolves. If it does, I I really don't know. It's a really wild time in golf at the moment, and it's. Um, it's really unprecedented and it's it's going to be really intriguing to see how it all plays out. Yeah, there's we got a lot of questions left to be answered. There's no yeah. doubt. I mean, there's no telling what could this game could look like in 2024 or 2025. Um, it's going to be very interesting. But when I do go to Australia, okay, all I hear about you, James Nitties, all these guys is, oh, we missed the meat pies. What what the hell is a meat pie? Yeah, um, so fucking, I hate meat pies. Um, Perfect. And, <laughs> yeah. No, stay clear of the meat pies. So what it is, is what a meat pie is, is think of sloppy meat inside a pastry, right? Mm. And, and a lot of Australians love it. I'm probably going to lose my passport for saying this, <laughs> but I hate them, right? What I love is sausage rolls, which is, which is like a sausage, but not encased, just the meat of the sausage, the mince or whatever you want to call it, and then encased in pastry. That is money. So grab a sausage roll. Dip it in some tomato sauce, ketchup, you're going to call it, and you'll be good to go, mate. You can try the meat pie if you want, but I think they're a pile of shit. I love this. Perfect. I love this Appetizer. Australian. <laughs> We're getting yeah. I want to go there more than anything, Greg, because I think by a percentage, everyone I meet from Australia, they, like they're the highest percentage of cool people that I know. Every single one. I used to travel with some dudes that you probably know. They're the best people in the world. But give me one thing. You've been in the States now for a while. If you could bring one thing from Australia to the States. Like the thing you miss the most? Yeah, it's a great question. I was just there a month ago, and what what we have? Um, I'm trying to think if it's food, sport, or the beaches. Like you have some lovely beaches here, but dude, some of our beaches in Sydney are just fucking awesome. And and what it is too is that everyone, what we do a really good job of in Australia is everyone, and you'll see this, a lot of people get outdoors because we build a lot of bike paths and running paths around all of our waterways. So you had this, you you kind of motivated to go look at the shit, right, and go run around and walk around and look at stuff. So um, if I was going to bring anything, though, it'd probably be, it'd be access to, um, it'd be access to the beaches. That'd be be the one thing I really miss. I just miss the ocean. Um, but I live in Dallas, so I should just move to fucking California or something. But um, you know that. No, don't you know, do that. Uh, uh, yeah, go yeah. to Galveston, Greg. Galveston, <laughs> <a> great place. <laughs> yeah. Great beaches. People rave about them. Compare them to Australia all the time. I've heard. The I Australia do miss some of, of the America. sport. I'm, I'm, I miss the sport too. You're about to, actually you're about to get some cricket over here. They're actually playing some one day cricket in uh, Dallas uh, coming up here in the next. I think it's July. Uh, you know, next few weeks. Um, they're trying to bring the game over here because we've got a lot of expats, a lot of Indians, and um, uh, people from Pakistan and things like that who love their cricket. So um, I think we might see a little more of that over here. And that's there's a fun version of cricket that doesn't take five days. It's actually a lot of fun to watch. That I was going to say I can't wait to make a bet on a cricket game and then find out a week later if I won. <laughs> <laughs> Keeps it exciting. <laughs> yeah, I don't understand that. Uh, Salish, should we get to the E9? Yeah, let's go to E9. But first, Greg, I want to give you a chance just because you do something that's extremely awesome that I know that you're proud of, as you should be. But Maximum Chances, the charity you started for autistic children. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And just for our listeners, if people are out there want to get involved, what they can do to, to help out? Yeah. Oh, thank you, mate. Uh, look, so basically, um, it's uh, named after my son, Max. He's 20 years old and he's on the autism spectrum, sort of diagnosed around 20 months. He's going to, he's actually going to A&M right now. He's a really high functioning kid and doing really well studying economics. Um, really proud of him. And then uh, we started Maximum Chances with a view to, it costs a lot of money and we, to pay for therapies and things like that. And we knew, well, we can afford it. That was fine. But what about other people? So we're a small footprint charity paying for, but very effective. Like we don't, we volunteer, we don't pay anybody. So a lot of the money that comes in, pretty much all of it goes back out, which is lovely. 
Um, but we just in the Dallas Metroplex paying for um, children's therapy, behavioral therapy, speech therapy, and things like that. So it's been really rewarding. If you go to maximumchances.org, um, if you either want money from us or you'd like to donate to us or anything like that, really appreciate that. Um, we'll look after your money and make sure that it gets uh, helps a young boy or girl say their first words or or deal with autism. It's um, it's very challenging. Man, Good that for is you, man. That's awesome. really really cool. Please. You got a lot on your plate. That's uh, you. spectacular. Good for you, Gregor. Go check that out. Yeah, maximumchances.org. All right, let's get to the E9 here. Chalmers, we do this with everyone. We ask this to, this is our first question every single time. You can trade lives with anyone. Be someone else for one day. Dead live, anyone in the history of the world, who would it be? Max Verstappen. Okay. Yeah, He's I'm, really good right now. I'm going Formula One, dude. I just, I got to know what that feels like. It'd be either Formula One or someone who's uh, like Taylor Swift, like singing in front of like billions of people. That'd be awesome too. Can't sing, but that'd be awesome. Greg, I can't sing. Basically, basically we're editing this. The Greg Chalmers wants to be Taylor Swift. <laughs> Taylor's a hell of an <laughs> answer, buddy. That's the teaser. <laughs> That's dude, the teaser. That's a hell of a, you've got the world by the balls. Yeah, the she's, ball. billion, she's a billion dollar industry right now. But oh imagine, stand, imagine stand on that stage with all those people. And you did that. You just own them, like they're they're in your hands. That'd be just what a feeling. That'd be awesome. It'd be unbelievable. Your concerts on this tour are three and a half hours long. Come on, yeah. really? Yeah, she, yeah. She Dude, puts on a show. In she's stadiums, right stadiums. Yeah, she's. Right. Yeah. You can. It's easy to hate on her, but like, I mean, they, I mean, the people that love her, they're like, it's like her own cult. Not when, not they, they when would I'm die. Really they would drink the Kool Aid for her tomorrow. You can't hate her when I'm reincarnated as a mate. When I'm going to be here for a day, I'm, I'm, I'm Taylor. Forget Mac, whatever his name is. You're Taylor Swift. This is yeah. great. I'm buying that ticket, Greg. I'm buying that ticket. I want backstage too. All right, bud. Taylor, go. I need to put put on your thinking cap here. I'm going to take you back. It's not that long ago though. 2020 travelers. Okay, your opening tee shot of the final round, and I need to know. <laughs> <laughs> Does Ian Poulter hold the PGA Tour record for loudest fart ever got on camera at a tour event? Yeah, what a bastard. He got me Holy good. Holy shit. Oh, I, thought he, I thought he pooped his pants. Yeah, so opening tee shot, and, and he he basically dumped it after I walked off the tee. And then on my Twitter blew up, like, Chalmers farts. I had TMZ, <laughs> a TMZ fucking called me and said, they, they reached out and said, do you want to talk about this? You're farting. And I said, it wasn't fucking me. It was him. So he ended up doing an interview sitting in one of his Ferraris talking about farting. Um, you know, so because, you know, Pulse would go to the opening of an envelope, I reckon. But anyway, it was, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a good one. You just need to stay away from me when that happens. And no crowds either. So it was like amplified. Normally you get yeah, a little background ooh, noise. That yeah. one, I was like, oh, my yeah, God. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's an issue. Not good. Not yep, good. Yep. Another record you're a part of on tour. No big deal. Mm, that's a tough one. All right. Well, we all have like, you know, important dates that we just never forget. Birthdays, you know, where we were when Tiger won the Masters, tax day, possibly anniversaries. Have you ever forgotten one? Anniversary or important date? Yeah. Uh, forgotten my, I forgot my dad's birthday once. Um, I haven't forgotten anniversaries yet. Um, I have a reminder set in my phone to make sure I don't. Well, are you lying to us right now? You're under oath. Because I was told you forgot your first wedding anniversary. Oh, did I? I might have. <laughs> you're not. You're not doing much for your case right now, Greg. You can't even remember what, if you forgot. Did Cameron Percy say that? I yeah. Might, oh, I might have. I, look, did look, I? Forget? I'm 49. It's all a fucking blur now. I don't know, dude. That's 20. Yeah, but your first. I mean, come on. Yeah. Look, he might be right. I, so yeah, like that. Yeah, I've moved on. <laughs> 13th, 16th, <laughs> like who gives a shit? But number one might be one that the wife you might yeah, care about. You might want to remember that. Yeah. yeah. Was that Percy that oh, gave you that, Colt? Yeah. Dude, probably. He's yeah. the best. I, by the way, my one tour start we mentioned earlier got paired with the great Cameron Percy. What a, what <laughs> a star. He, yeah, he had to put up with my bullshit looking for my ball everywhere. What a great dude. <laughs> Shout out to him. All right. You mentioned this a little bit earlier, but Greg Norman, he's got a wine. As does another guy who I'm sure you're friends with down in your neck of the woods, Frank Nabolo. All right. You only get to drink one of their wines for the rest of your life. Who's are you picking? Oh, Frank. Really? Yeah, Frank. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I'm not a white wine guy, but New Zealand white wine is phenomenal. Um, and and I like Frank more. 
<laughs> that's basically it. That's easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just, I just like, oh, I, I, love, I love me some Frank Nobolo. He's a great dude. Could taste like wolf he, piss, but you'll take Frank. Yeah, Got it. Yes. <laughs> Boy, I hope he doesn't listen to this because I love Frank Nobolo too. Man, <laughs> he's what a great. Dude. That's awesome. All right, next one. Who is the most famous person that has ever offered you golf advice, but you actually had no idea who they were? Hmm. Feels uh, specific. Yeah, very. And a tough one for me because I don't roll with a lot of famous people. Uh, the most famous person out in non-golf terms, I have, you know, I played with, um, Bill Lane Beer at a Max Fly Day and Charles Barkley was there and Dale Jarrett. It was just a who's who of like sport people. But they didn't offer me golf advice, mate. I, I, I don't I don't really elicit a lot of advice. I'm sorry, Colt, when it comes to I heard I heard there was a legendary Australian golfer named Norman oh, Von Nita oh, that uh, yes. offered you some advice. Fuck. I, oh, yeah, that, I now that believe that you yeah. forgot your first anniversary one hundred percent. Your memory <laughs> sucks. Yes. Oh no, you gotta hear this one. So I'm standing on the range and Norman Von Nida, and he is, yes, he's very famous in Australia. He's an awesome player. He's this little old dude at the time and I'm a young man and he can't see though, right? Norman can't see, like he's certified blind at the time. Anyway, and he's listening to the sound of my strike and he's like, you hooked that one, didn't you? And he does this and I'm like, yeah, you hooked that one and he does this like six in a row and I'm, now I'm getting pissed. And I'm like, who is this little guy? Anyway, I turn around, I said, are you a coach, are you? And he goes, oh, hi, I'm Norman Von Nider. And shoots his hand out and shake my hand. I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> right, yeah. I heard but, you were embarrassed. Yeah, oh, my Rod Pampling. God. Yeah, and the worst was Rod Pampling was right there and saw it all. And he's the worst because he will. he's never going to forget it and he's always going to give me shit about it. So, yes, that, that was Norman Von Nider, yes. Good call. <laughs> we just got to kickstart like the memory a little bit. Then it gets yeah, going. Yeah, then yeah, it gets go. going. Yeah. Understandable. All right. By Mike. the way, yeah. Greg, don't forget, you turned 50 in October. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't that, forget. Don't worry. I won't forget that. I got that. Easy pencil one. In. Yeah. Not an easy one to forget there. Um, all right. My next one, Greg. Have you ever received a very sincere thank you from Adam Scott for being the first swinging? devastatingly handsome Australian pro and basically giving him the blueprint for his entire career. <laughs> I feel like you're owed one. <laughs> I'm being I, said honest. To, I said to um, I, one of my buddies went out and watched the Byron Nelson and I said, oh, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go up to Adam Scott as he's walking by and, I said, and ask him if he thinks Greg Chalmers is the best looking Australian golfer. And uh, he, uh, Scotty, Scotty's a beaut. He, he's such a good dude and he's, and uh, he didn't. He didn't play along at the time. I think it was actually mid fucking round. Like he was had a bit going on. <laughs> but uh, yes, look. I, 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 like, I remember I played with him in Chicago one year, and it was him and Camilo Vajegas. Oh. And I, I walked off the tee. I turned to my caddy at the time it was Mal Baker. He worked for Taylor Gooch. Now I said, Mal, I'm bringing him through the gates today. Have a look at this crowd. And <laughs> you know, just gorgeous looking people everywhere. Because those two, good looking humans. Just three sex symbols in one group. I mean, yeah, my dude. goodness. He owes you at the least a thank you, if not some, you know, financial compensation for that. Yeah. Yeah. He's a walking coat hanger. He's just yeah, awesome. he's, he's Chalmers 2.0, period. That's what everybody Yeah, no. Nah, no. Nah. Mm -hmm. I wish it were true, but it's not. <laughs> All right. Next one. Has not traveling with an umbrella because your cheap ass doesn't want to pay the overweight baggage fee ever come back and bitch you? Yeah, so no, I traveled with one, but I left it in my fucking hotel room. Um, I was, I, I think you're referring to Puerto Rico. I was actually one off the lead and we got stuck. I had a local caddy and started pissing rain. We had these three storms run through and I'm standing there. And of course, I'm in a white fucking shirt as well. So I'm standing there <laughs> and I've got hair just flowing through my wet shirt, like the worst wet t-shirt competition ever and no umbrella. And a local caddy doesn't know what he's doing. And I'm like, you, it's literally a mile away in the hotel. And I, yeah, dumb, fucking stupid. It wasn't an oversized baggage. So I'm never worried about that. I'm good. Your friends are, your friends are bad liars then. <laughs> they said it's because you're too cheap to pay because your bag was going to be over 50 pounds. Yeah, I don't, yeah, no, I don't know if I'm cheap. I'm happy to pay the bill. I, I just, uh, I'm just a bit stupid sometimes. But God, what a treat great. for those Puerto Rican fans getting to see the Greggy out there, a little wet tea. <laughs> you know what I mean? They probably showed up the next day in droves for that, hoping yeah. it rained. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it ran through the gates. Smart. Yeah. Smart. That's PIP shit. Imagine if. You know what I mean? 
Imagine if that happened in Chicago with Camille and Scotty. I mean, <laughs> oh, my God. Goodness gracious. Uh, they would have oh taken God. their rain gear off so fast out of jealousy. <laughs> <laughs> they would have wanted in on that shit I love, immediately. I love how you guys play along. It's awesome. Yeah, right, dude, we're no dummies. <laughs> we know who's drawing these. We know who they want to see. <laughs> All right, Greggy, this one's actually a serious one. This You might not even know this, and this might be a huge compliment that you're about to get for the first time, but we asked Jordan mm -hmm. Spieth on this show who he would most want to hit a 10-foot putt if his life was on the line. And the two rules were he can't say himself and he can't say Tiger Woods. And his answer was you. So now I'm asking you the same question, okay? 10-footer, life or death, you can't hit it, nor can Tiger. Who do mm -hmm. you want? Yeah, I actually heard that. Um, it was actually That's a pretty big compliment. Yeah, it was actually Faxon. Faxon texted me. He he was listening to you guys, and he said, oh, "I I just heard this, um, Jordan." And then I think he came on a second time, and he said he wanted me for left to righters and Jason Day for right to lefters. He tweaked I think it. you guys, yeah, tweaked it a little bit. Um, yeah, that's a massive compliment um, for for like someone who's pretty awesome at it himself, to be honest. Um, Not terrible. No, um, I would pick. Uh, yeah, probably either Luke Donald or Faxon. I, I'll go with Faxon just because he's my mate and he's awesome. Um, I think great putters, and this is what I love about Fax. We talk a little bit about it because I stay at his house at the Honda sometimes and every time I go there. And, and I think great putters have a connection to the hole and they look like they're hunting. And bad putters look like they're too conscious of their movement and too into just stuff going on in their body. And, and Fax is very good at that. He looks like he's looking out at the target and trying to just – adjust on the fly and it's very athletic. And, and so I'd put faith in that. I'll go with that. I like that's beautiful, that. good beautiful putters like hunting. That's, mm -hmm, that's good. That's really, really good. All right. My last one, you know, there's tons of pranks going on out on the PGA tour. Guys love joking with each other behind the scenes. You Aussies do it about as good as anybody. Our long lost friend, Jared Lyle, who, who we lost a few years ago, who we all love. I know y'all had an incredible relationship and like to give each other a hard time. Can you give us a good Jared Lyle story? Oh, yeah. Yeah. What a hoot. He's such a good dude. Like, he was such a lovely mm. man. And the thing with Jared was that he loved to swear, you know, and most Australians do. Um, but he would always greet you with, hey, you fucking going, right? And then, uh, or he'd throw <laughs> something on the end of it as well, you know, throw the C word in there as well. So we're on the <laughs> range in Canada. And I was playing with him that day. It was a Corn Ferry event. And uh, I said, look, I'll, I'll bet you 100 you can't, you can't go all day without swearing. And we're warming up. He goes, oh, fuck yeah, I can do that. No problem. Right? And so I'm like, all right, it starts now. Right? And so we're walking to the tee. We only walk, you know, 50 yards. He gets on the tee and he's meeting the other guy we're playing with. He goes, how are you, mate? How are you fucking going? I'm like, that'll be 100. <laughs> right? He could, 10 minutes is all he could last. He was such a good dude. And uh, just a... Just an absolute, I really miss him. He's a lovely man um, and just, just sucks what he went through. Um, but most of, the, most of the fun stuff, I think, went on when we were way younger. You know, like it, it, when you get pro, there's less of that going on. You know, I, Cole, I'm sure you're aware there's, you know, the Tom Gillis and, the, and those guys and Carl oh. Pedersen, they, they got into it with some really funny stuff. But it's, it's, it's less and less now. It's, it's probably when you're young kids and in college days or, for kids over here when they do more of the fun and exciting stuff. Well, social media has ruined everything. I mean, you can't do anything without it going to the whole world. But, yeah. man, that's funny you said that about the, the no swearing game with Jared Law. I actually did the same thing with him, too, before. Oh, really? And he, he went along all day, and then he looked at me and mouthed, fuck. He just goes like this when he hit a bad shot, and I go, counts. Yeah. Definitely yeah. counts. Yeah, so there you go. But he was, man, I, I miss that guy so much. He was one of my favorites. Um, yeah. God, he could play too. Really good player. Yeah, he's, he's just just awesome. What he got, uh, what he gave to the game, and what he got out of the game. It was uh, it was just wonderful. But, uh, and and you know, it's uh, it's a, it's just sad. Yeah. Well, Greg, man, we can't thank you enough yeah, for dude. coming on. This has been so much fun. And by the what way, what are you doing next week? Keep up <laughs> your incredible Twitter game. Your your Twitter game is fantastic right now. Well, I'm having Cole, Drew. I'm having so much fun on Twitter right now because I'm in this age bracket now where I just don't give a shit, right? And beautiful. so it's beautiful. And and so what I'm doing now, if it makes me chuckle or it makes me look um, pretend good or it, it it makes me look bad, even I'm, I just put it out there and I'm just enjoying myself. I don't delve into politics or any bullshit or any opinion stuff. If it makes me have a smile, I put it out. 
Um, or and, and my other rule is it ha- or it informs, like I might something about the golf course or something like that. Um, and so yeah, I'm I'm really enjoying that right now, and and I just ignore any toxic crap and move on. That's a beautiful Please thing. Keep, keep that it attitude is. of not giving a shit. We need more people like that yes. in the world, Greg. We could yes. use more of that. Bro. Awesome. Greg Chalmers, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for joining us. Thanks, guys. All right. Well, that was the Aussie Greg Chalmers joining us on Subpar. Man, that one was a lot of fun. This guy, he's, I mean, what a career he's had. Up, down, all around the world. But our first in- very interesting answer, I thought, you know, we had Gary Woodland who thought Denzel Washington would play him in a movie. Who could mm. Greg Chalmers be? Uh, Taylor Swift. I don't think the crowd would even notice. No, dude, not a chance. The Greggy. I love that he calls himself the Greggy on his Twitter. <laughs> He's the most self-deprecating man in the world. He makes Joel Damon look confident in himself. But that interview, dude, like that just solidifies my stance that I've always said. Is like per person I, that I've met in my life, I think Aussies are the coolest breed of human in the world. They're awesome. They get it. They like to have a good time. They don't take things too seriously. And he's just like that. I love hearing the the Poulter fart story because that was massive at the time. Uh, It was beautiful. I also, you know, telling him about the Jordan Spieth putt thing, too, I thought was pretty cool. Like, he'd heard about that, I guess, as well. I think Fax had told him about it. He said, so he knew that. But that's pretty high praise. And then he went back and flipped it to Fax as well. But, dude, just we need more. We need more Greggies out there because the guy just gets it. I loved it, man. That was so much fun. And I'm so excited to go to Australia for the first time at the end of October for the Asian Pacific Am. Play some golf down there. Um, it's going to be really cool. And hopefully run into a few more Greggies. That'll be a lot of fun. Um, really enjoyed that with him. But some sad news we got to pass along. Yeah. Uh, you know, friend of the program here. We've had him on a couple of times. One of our most popular interviews, Pat Perez. His brother, Mike, tragically passed away at 43 years old um, recently. And just thoughts and prayers to that family. Uh, that's a tough one. Pat and Mike were very close. Um, I was re- relatively close with Mike. Loved the guy. Always had a smile on his face. Was the life of the party. And uh, gone too soon. Yeah, man. It's That was shocking news, devastating news. When we heard it this past weekend, man, Mike is a guy that I, I played a lot of jickies with Mike throughout the years, man. And he was always the guy, always the energy, always the guy making a move, fun to go out with after the tournaments ended and things like that. And you just couldn't not have a good time when you're around Mike. So extremely sad news. Thoughts are with Pat, the rest of the family during this time, man. Um, young man, 43 years old, dude, way too soon. Yeah. Very, very tough. You know, he was one of those guys. I mean, he, he's obsessed with the game of golf, played it professionally for a little bit, didn't make it, but still watches every second of golf. Text me during every single broadcast. I'm going to miss that a lot, but rest in peace, my man, you'll be missed. That's going to do it for us this week. We'll talk to you on the next subpar.